<laughs> so I got a good friend of mine, uh, Abe, also known as Kush for Breakfast, creator of the Smarty Strain, uh, here with me. I what have we known each other about 10 years? So I think we'll try and take it back pretty far here and uh, yeah, kind of go back into it. the history of weed. Yeah. Yeah, I think close to like like eight, eight to 10, maybe like eight years. Because I think, um, so I had heard about you online through like IC Mag, um, then found out about, you know, your, your seed company. And, um, I remember, I remember seeing you guys booth at the first High Times Cup in Fremont, which is in Seattle, and I think it was maybe two thousand, sometime between two thousand twelve and fourteen. If I had to guess, like twelve or thirteen. And um, yeah, I remember going to you guys' booth, um, seeing a couple of uh, plants of some, just like at the time just rare strains that i had never seen before it was like the original diesel and the uk cheese and um i just remember like trying to buy clones off of um the vendors at the booth and they were just like like we don't sell clones like we sell seeds so sorry i know it's like a long this is like a long backstory as to like how i met you but um i remember seeing i think it was on instagram you guys are doing a seed drop at herbs house and um you know because i couldn't get the clones from the thing i was all right let me figure something else out right and i found out that you liked hash and at the time um it's like when i first started learning how to make like bubble hash uh matt rise who's a pretty popular guy on instagram and nick T, right and then like uh i think like jibs and them too out of colorado mm -hmm. the microplane gang yeah so that's like <laughs> how i like learned how to make hash was like what i saw like what i like learned before like really crude ways of making it and then seeing that like new wave of hash making at the time and just learning from that so i learned how to make some decent hash and found out that you liked hash so i was like you know well, let me try to like uh barter with this guy right because that's like <laughs> that is my like that's, that's the way that's my way of like working in the certain circles or like you know being able to like meet people that normally don't really like to meet new people it's like well, let me find out what this guy's like vice is or like what he likes and so I remember uh, DMing you on Instagram. I was like, hey, you want to trade some hash for some seeds? <laughs> and, you know, at the time, I honestly didn't even want the seeds. I was just like, I just, I want the fucking clones. And, um, and you're like, oh, man, it got to be, it has to be good. You're like, this shit's got to be like 90 plus, 90 plus melt type shit. And I was just like, like, uh, I was like, man, I, just, like, I, I think you might like it, right? And, um it was up some flavors. I think it was like some Wubba. It was the Wubba for sure. Yeah. I remember right. that. Basement uh, Herb's house. Yeah, exactly. With Jeff. Yep. And so, you know, I just I just took that as like um, an opportunity to like meet you. And generally, it's just like, you know, like-minded people just tend to click. And um, yeah, we met, you know, just talked about weed and... Yeah, that was the first time. That was the first time I met you, and then from there, uh, yeah, we just you know seemed to have like a lot in common, and just became pretty cool. Yeah, sorry for the long backstory, but yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much that is how uh, me and Flesh met. Yeah, for sure. I I remember it vividly for sure because so for people that don't know, Herb's House is a dispensary. It's now a recreational dispensary in uh, Ballard, Washington not far from Ballard High School, which is like I, where I had a house. And um, <clears throat> and uh, that's where Northern Lights was made now that we find many years later. Mm -hmm. And it's just, uh, that's where the indoor sun shop is, which is the seeds that um, came from Steve Murphy that turned into Northern Lights. 
it's historically just been an area where a lot of people grow weed because there's houses with basements and uh, your neighbors won't bother you about anything and uh, it's just easy to get away with. Yeah, definitely. Um, in that area, whereas, you know, at the time, you know, 20 years ago, especially, and even 10 years ago up here, um, you had to be selective with where you would put a garden and you wanted to avoid areas with nosy neighbors, essentially. Mm hmm and oh, hold on a sec. so yeah i remember uh so herbs house is a dispensary in um that was a medical dispensary that jeff and another friend of ours sam who uh were hash uh, are also hash makers and i had jeff on just recently and uh sam is also like the person when i first got out of high school i moved into an uh, apartment in factoria which is right outside bellevue and sam lived in an apartment complex right at the end of the neighborhood where i had like is a, this the same sam that used to come with jeff you have like the, yeah the beard okay exactly okay. and <laughs> sam had a couple strains the tarantula mm -hmm. Um, and he had this other stuff I think he called the Mason County for like Mason County down south. And he had uh the connect for this other strain called the Millie, which you yeah, the Millie's up. Yeah. Which was a super earthy, supposedly Thai Indian North Pakistani strain, clone only from up here. Mm -hmm. Um I lost it recently, but I have lots of seeds of it. I made some face off Millie crosses that basically encapsulate the same flavor. And, um, so yeah, that herbs house kind of played a role in that. And, and, uh, you know, unfortunately times have changed and it's just a recreational dispensary now. Yeah. But at the time, uh, myself and Jeff met you down, um, at the, in the basement, we smoked some weed, I think, or yep. smoked some hash over there. Yeah. And then you ended up coming by our house, coming by my house, and you know we'd we'd basically hang out and fucking nerd out on weed science and strain history and crap together. Yep. And that was like, uh, you know, also tying into um, kind of the evolution of hash making from the microplaning, like you were talking about, to uh, the freeze drying. Yeah. And then also with uh, Cuban grower at the time, we were both friends and, and yeah. making hash, and he was making the, the some dry awesome sim. hash. Yeah. And he was making, um, doing his, uh, his dry sift tech. Yeah. The Cuban tech. Yep. Which, um, you know, him and I did an entry in, uh, at the legends of hash and I brought him back like the memorabilia and stuff. Cause he was unable to attend mm -hmm. and, um, and our hash got disqualified. Right. right. Which I'm still a little bit salty about. Wait, now. What? I didn't, I never, I didn't know that. Yeah. So the hash got DQ'd because so here, what happened is. Um, my partner in the store down in, uh, Portland, mm -hmm. Mac had grown some nice shram and I went and got the trim. And at the time we had a frozen, it was freezing weather up here. And, uh, and Cuban was able to make some dry sift out of some like fresh shram trim. Yep. So I smuggled that to Amsterdam with me to enter in legends of hash and the, fr the refrigerator at my hotel room broke while I was staying there and I didn't realize it. And my hash started buttering. Yeah. Right. And like the, the legends of hash thing wasn't until the end of the week. So it had already started buttering, but it was like, I mean, full melt dry sift still was like not fully buttered. You could still see all the triceps and everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it just reeked of that lemon Colombian shram yeah. incense haze. And at the time, everybody thought that if the hash nucleated or um, buttered on you, that it had water in it and yeah. that it was an inferior product. And I've always been adamant that that is not the case because if it had water in it, I wouldn't be able to dry sift it, right. first of all. Yeah. And, uh, and then after using the freeze dryer, it's like I know I've just dried this because it went through the process and – it still butters, you know, so how does, how does that work? And so we knew that was terpenes anyways, uh, you know, skunk man, Sam and bubble man DQ'd my entry just because it was buttered. And, um, I was a little disappointed that that was the case because I really thought that they would have had the same experience 
with really high quality hashes I had. And, you know, now years later, we know that that is the case. The stuff that butters the fastest is usually the highest terpene content mm -hmm. and has nothing to do with inferior process or a, a lack of quality. Um, it's simply high terpene content and volatility. Um, so that was kind of that, that history. And, uh, and yeah, it's, you know, the, the dry sift scene, scene has seemed to have fallen off a little bit, but it's still, in my opinion, one of the, the highest quality products that should be revered as such. Right? Yeah. It's so hard to make. I think there's like a, there's a handful of people that still do like, you know, really good high quality dry sift. Um, but yeah, I think because like most people don't know how to do it properly and because it's like a lot easier to make water hash and then turn that into rosin, I think that's maybe why um, the dry sift isn't as popular as it should be. Um, but you know, I mean, there's like definitely variables to it because like not all dry sift is better than water hash. Not all water hash is better than dry sift. And that all comes down to like, I mean, a big part of it is definitely like the starting material, you know, so... Um, and it's very strain specific so it's yeah. like if you you know if you really like smoking og well you're really not ever going to get og dry sift yeah it's just sure. not going to happen i yeah. mean maybe if you had a giant garden and had a really painstaking process for the trimming and the collection of the resin and then got a clean resin that you could then further clean mm -hmm. maybe right but then you're talking you know essentially what the old skunk, skunk man sam myth which is you know, 10 grams from every thousand grams or something like that. You know, an yeah. infinitely small yield in yeah, return. Yeah, because I mean, shit, OG already, like, yield shit for water hash just because of the type of uh, trichrome resin glands that it has. That's why you don't see too many people make OG water hash. Um, but yeah, so with dry sieve, I could imagine it yielding even less and being in uh, an even harder process to collect. But when you do make some OG bubble, that shit's unmatched. <laughs> exactly. Like flavor is, I mean, if you like OG, that's just definitely like palate staining. Just that shit definitely brings me back to like uh, the early 2000s, like when medical was like the shit in California, especially like, you know, Southern California. They were definitely known as being like, home of the ogs right like i used to go down there in the summer times just to fucking get my medical card and go to dispensary and just buy og to smoke because at that time like i mean our medical scene out here um popped off a little bit later but even then like people out here didn't really have like real og i mean like the the average you know what i'm saying like i know you've had it out here for a while but like as far as everybody else I remember going to the dispensary once, like when I first got my medical card, probably in like maybe 2009 or 10. And I went to this uh, dispensary and just got, I was like offended that like this, they just, they labeled some bud like, like Orange County OG or some shit like that. Right. And I was like, smell it, man. This doesn't even smell like OG. Like the fuck, like, like how can you just like throw that name on anything but i mean that's just what it was at the time it's like every like every different type of kush you could think of and it should probably didn't have any kush in it well that was like kind of the beginning of the marketing of cannabis yeah because of um what the collect or i'm trying to I guess at that yeah, like time, what the hype was at the time. Like, yeah. At the time, Kush was like. T just only 10 years prior to that, there was no real such thing as hype, though. Yeah. Because unless you weed, saw it in High Times Magazine, yeah. your sphere of cannabis was just who you knew. That yeah. was it. And, and if the weed was good, the weed was good. It didn't matter if it was Kush or this. You never exactly, heard of Kush. Yeah. The, the name didn't matter. It was just what was the quality yeah, of it. Yeah. Dank weed was dank weed. Exactly. Like, and now there was a much more honest marketplace at that time because there was no incentive to lie for marketing. And we are now actually in like basically the complete opposite scenario where the vast majority of strains and brands are just renames 
of other varieties or just complete knockoffs of other varieties or historical names. 100%. It's kind of sad that people don't even care about authenticity no more or like the history and lineage of, you know, the strains that they're consuming. Like people just don't care anymore. Like if I was just, let's just say I was like sort of fly by night breeder and I came out with some shit and I'm like, yep, I got, you know, a, B, C, D clones and, you know, and just name any type of like hype strain or highly sought after strain. And nobody's going to fucking question like, okay, where'd you get it from? Like, what's the chain of reference behind it? How do I know that what you have is really what it is? And like, be able to trace that shit back either to the breeder or like as far as possible. Right. But people don't care anymore. Like. I could sell seeds and say, oh, yep, I fucking made seeds with uh, M- the Moonbow 112 or uh, somebody's breeder's cut. It's like, the fuck, like, breeder cut? Like, who who even who even names their sh- Like, oh, yep, this is the breeder's cut. Like, I don't know. That shit throws me off, too, is, like, people that name clones after themselves when, like, they didn't create it or anything, anything like like It's appropriation. <laughs> like sour diesel for example right yeah like damn like how is there this many different cuts of sour diesel and all named after people that can't really show that they've made it or bred it like i don't know well i think more than anything it's a lot of these people haven't been around long enough so their frame of reference is like let's say only 10 years and it's you know i'll have people ask me like when we were selling the sour diesel clone down at the portland store Mm -hmm. they're like what sour diesel cut is this and it's like dude i got this before there was named sour diesels like there was just sour d original diesel and um you'd heard of like day wrecker and these other phenos yeah but that was it right you know you did, we didn't know about them we just had heard stories that there may be other bag seeds of bag seed creations let's call them yeah. of diesel or chem dog offspring or hybrids we didn't i mean even at that time we didn't even really know anyone that had chem 91 i think uh shaw 707 seed bank was like the only person i really knew that had talked about chem dog 91 mm-hmm. at that time and um because i think him and skunk va were relatively close to each other like in the lake tahoe sacramento okay. area in between there mm-hmm. um and th- i think they had met up at, w- at one point in time but you know back then and you know, i'm talking 2004 5 6 um when someone someone showed me sour diesel it was always the same thing yeah there wasn't like 14 different versions of it and the same thing like relatively speaking for og kush i mean like you know the face off did was a bag seat i popped mm-hmm. right the poison was a bag seat that the real og cushman um source genetics popped like we gave those names because we can't just say that they're og kush yeah because we not... they're bag seeds and exactly. that was all we had access to that's all there was and you know what it was just around that time where the the forum started having some kind of marketing value rather than only an educational value mm-hmm. that you started seeing, you know, the Tahoe story and the SFD and all these, you know, new named cuts. Whereas prior to that, it was pretty much people just called it OG Kush. And the only time it would get a moniker is just to differentiate that we knew it had either come from seed or it was some random cut, likely from some online guy that you can't really verify if they're lying or not. So you just kind of give it the name of wherever they got it from. You know, I mean, yeah. even just like with the ghost OG, right? Yeah. No, ghost never sent that to people calling it ghost OG. Yeah. He just sent it to people called OG Kush because that's how he, or actually he sent it to people called Ogers, O-G-E-R-S, mm-hmm. right? Which was what Ken, Oregon kid, used to call his OG. Ogers Kush was just like a slang name. They'd so say. no relation to like, ogre kush no so the ogre o-g-r-e which ended up later becoming confused with the ogers kush Uh um was a sensi star phenotype and it was like some kind of like 
at the time there was three or four Sensi Star clones, and that was like a really popular Dutch strain. No, from, definitely. Uh, yeah, I remember the Sensi Star. I'm trying to remember who made it. Who made Sensi Star? Paradise Seeds. And, uh, you know, people would grow those. I grew a couple packs of them myself. And it was the phenotypes ranged from like almost like a Trinity burnt rubber mm-hmm. kind of smell. Not exactly, but in that realm to like a train wrecky Hawaiian indica kind of smell. Right. The ones that I would come across, I'm not sure what a Hawaiian indica smells like, but the ones that I would come across were like overripe, fruity, funky, um, maybe like a little bit of like the train wrecky, hazy mm-hmm. kind of thing in the background. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, but definitely like super fruity and funky, but not mm-hmm. like fruity and like a... Not like a Skittles fruity. Yeah, it's no, like no, that no. Old... Or not, not even like overly sweet, but like... Like super ripe fruit, funky, just like yeah. Dutch fruit, like we've talked yeah, about. Yeah. That skunk one NL Dutch fruit. Yeah, funk. definitely, definitely what I've smelled in some like variations of skunk, like that type of fruity. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see, where does that put us? Where are we at? Skunk Sensi Star. Um, uh, oh, OG, yeah. right? So that was kind of you know, and I'd say around 2006 is when Pete really like the naming of like og kush clones started just going berserk and yeah. there was just you know everything from hollywood to all these different nicknames uh, the for star wars series all like the, the fucking, yeah the mars og yeah, the interplanetary the planetary stuff. series and... and really all that stuff was just someone who had gotten the og clone whether it was a bag seed or the cut that came from josh or whoever's whoever it came from or through and just the variations in cultivation style. Yeah. And people would go into this, or the dispensary owner would be like, get, you know, 20, I mean, at the time, there'd be like 30 kinds of OG on the shelf. Yeah, you can't, you can't sell call like, them all the same yeah, OG. Sure. So what do you do? Skywalker, this or that, or whatever. I remember about. they would even break it down into like size of nugs, right? And like the biggest nugs would be like the private reserve. Exactly. Right. And then the next tier is like, this is like the top shelf. I've seen every marketing strategy right. in the back of the yeah. dispensary for 40 different pounds of OG, but all the same, basically. Yeah. And I've seen multiple different marketing strategies all work equally well. That California medical weed game. The hundred percent. I mean, that was the OG game in yeah, LA where it was sure. like, man, I mean, you could, you could sell anything basically as long as it had that smell, that taste and that look like OG. Yeah. No, those were some good days though, man. Cause I remember like, outside of california or outside of southern california um like in northern california you used to see so much variety on the shelves like there was an incentive for growers to just like grow different shit you know it, it wasn't about hype like if the weed was good they would get like pretty good you know um compensation for it and so that gave growers an incentive to just grow so many different varieties and um uh, it's definitely something that I miss. Um, ever since things, ever since the markets started to be uh, driven by hype, mm-hmm. um, there's no incentive for growers to just grow unique shit anymore. Everybody just wants to grow what sells the easiest. Hey, did you see that ship act that they're trying yeah, to pass? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that may be a silver lining if it passes, if federal legalization yeah. happens. A lot of ifs there, but. Um, it's a good idea, right? For sure. The SHIP Act is um, an act being pushed, I think, through Congress right now by several legal marijuana state representatives, right, uh, to allow businesses that are under $5 million a year in gross revenue, I believe, to ship uh, cannabis to any other state when legalization happens direct to consumer so if you're a small farm in oregon washington colorado any any rec legal state they're trying to make at least pass laws that allow you to basically become a mail order dispensary of your brand yeah that'd be that'd be sick it'd be a good opportunity um the question will be how do you find financing to get those things done now that the industry's gotten its legs chopped off Right. And, you know, you can't you can't run a 20 lighter to make 
a million bucks to fund such an operation anymore. Yeah. So we'll see how the market changes, but um, I it's nice to see that there are some public representatives that are at least aware of the issue at hand and the viability of just the cannabis marketplace in general and whether or not consumers are going to get to experience the variety and quality of cannabis that we got to experience um, starting out. And, you know, to kind of relate the, the OG back to up here, what you were saying earlier, I was the, the very first time I got OG was two clones. I got the abusive OG from online, which was from uh, um, the forum member abusive, which was not OG Kush. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was probably a, um, either a bag seed or a seed from uh, OG Kush seeds that Ken had sold. Um, Oregon Kid, his OG Cali Kush seeds back in 2003 to 2005. I mean, I, I think that's something people gloss over too. That in 2003, four, Ken Oregon Kid, he um, released thousands of packs of OG S ones and Bubba Kush S ones through uh, um, Seeds Direct or Gypsy Nirvana, mm -hmm. right? Um, I believe it was either there or Heaven Stairway. I can't remember. And it wasn't but a couple few years later that people have all these new OG clones all over the country. I remember you saying, I remember you telling me that story about like all the S1s. I just, I forgot if it was either from Oregon Kid or both. But yeah. I, I do remember telling you that. They That's both probably... actually did it. Oh, okay. So it's actually, so Ken did it first and that was Cali Kush Seeds. And if you ever meet Ken, you'll see he has a tattoo of Cali Kush Seeds on it. Mm -hmm. Right. And that was like back in the day. And, um, and uh, and then Ghost, who had purchased the clone from Ken for a thousand dollars, sent him five hundred first. Mm -hmm. Then Ken sent the clone. Then Ghost never paid him the other five hundred. So, not always the best yeah. uh, um, situation. But um, he also started doing uh, what was the name of that company? Three C's, right? So it's Three C's Seed Company. And they made Ghost OG and Bubba Kush S ones also, and they were both using the Elite X Elite um, hybridization formula, mm -hmm. What's that? which was being which was the feminine feminization uh -huh. formula being sold by Hyde H Y D, uh -huh. um, who still sells. That oh, product. just like a basically like silver thiol sulfate. Yeah, STS, okay. but his proprietary okay. formula, mm -hmm. right? Before people really were hip to it and at the time i mean we're talking early 2000s uh, you know 2002 2003 2004 2005 um i think dutch passion had only been marketing feminized seeds for maybe five years at that point in time since like 97 or, or so mm -hmm. maybe 98 so feminized seeds was kind of still new on the market and i think the the science for that I, I think that um, David Watson, Scott, Skunk Man Sam, or Robert Connor Clark, mm -hmm. I think one of the two of them were the ones that either figured out or developed or found the formula for silver thiosulfate mm -hmm. from, you know, from other research they had done about plants. And they were the ones that had brought it to the Dutch scene. Okay. And then... Uh, but but I'm not positive of that. Maybe um, I think the guy's name is Keys. Maybe the the lead guy at Dutch Passion. Maybe he's the one that figured it out. But basically, at that time, Hybe is a is a commercial nursery guy from Oregon, and he had figured out a formula that he still sells that works really good, and that was Elite X Elite, and they sold that on Heaven Stairway. And I think Hybe also was like he he had a he was pretty well known on the forums at that time. Because he, I think he had this strain called Dank Ass Bitch, the dab, mm -hmm. that or D A B, and that was like a really sought after clone. Like at that time, the Dank Ass Bitch, the Jacks Cleaner, which was Subcool's yep. plant, and anything from Nebu, right, which was the Blackberry Hybrids and the Cherry AK Forty Seven, and the Cherry Lime Ricky, mm -hmm. <coughs> those and Dutch Flowers which was like metal haze and you know, all these varieties that basically got sold on Seabay 
which was the Heaven Stairway Cannabis World Overgrow kind of back end. Yeah. Um, auction website, just like eBay. Yeah, see, that was like prior to. Uh, back then, I wasn't internet savvy at all. Yeah, so like, this was pre two thousand five, I'd say. Uh, yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't even growing, but I. I think I first started growing in like two thousand seven. Two thousand seven, two thousand eight. And, um, see, I didn't know shit about buying seeds online back then. And it was just like, like, let's send my money to somebody and just, like, hope for some seeds in the mail. Like, that's all. That seems, like, sketchy. It but, was sketchy. <clears throat> but there was, what other choice did you have? Fucking, for me, it was just, like, bag seeds. And, um, I mean, I just grew. So, like, my first introduction to growing weed was from some, like, you know, this Vietnamese guy that, like, uh, he was, like, buddies with one of my other good friends that I did a lot of work with during the Canadian days. Um, and uh, they had a growth spot together, and my homie ended up moving to the Midwest. And then he asked his friend, like, hey, can, like, you know, can my buddy take over? He was cool with it. And um, I don't know where they got their clone from, probably – from Canada or some mm-hmm. or seeds from Canada, but that that was like the access that I had to plants was just clones from people who were already growing or bag seeds. Um, didn't even really know about the forms until like until I started growing with you know with uh, my friend and. Um, he had some other legal issues and so you know i was just like hey it's probably like a better idea if like you didn't really come to the spot you know just let me like run the shit and i'll mean i'll sell the weed and when it's sold i'll give you half the money um fuck i just lost my train of thought (laughs) um oh forums so okay so boom so the forums right um, so yeah, once we made the, you know, the, the, the agreement that he wouldn't come to the spot anymore, I mean, I had no other friends that were growing weed, even like talking about growing weed was like super taboo at the time. So I had to just like figure out shit and just fucking Google. And that's how I like found out about the forums and just started like lurking on there. And then I, that's when I like got introduced to like seed companies Right, but I still didn't know about like like doing auctions online and like all that shit was just completely foreign to me. So, um, when the medical scene started, which was probably like a couple years after I started growing, people were I would go to like these farmers markets and people were just like selling clones and shit. Right, so I'm like, whoa, like, like. Now I now I have access to shit, and um, that and being online and just like reading stories and seeing strains and you know hearing about like the hype shit in California, that what that like made me um, like seek out like clones and shit right like hunting for certain hype strains and things that I wanted to grow because of like the history behind them or whatever. Well, you grew up between here and Sacramento, right? Yeah. So born and raised in Seattle. I went to high school in Sacramento between 99 and 03. And I mean, at that time I was just like, I was just a consumer, you know, I was just like a stoner just, going to places and having different dealers and just trying to always find the best weed that I could to smoke. And then when I moved back up to Seattle in 03, um, I had like a little bit of downtime where I, was, I wasn't really doing shit for like a year. And then like 04, um, I had got together with uh, one of my relatives and he was doing some work with like Canadian shit. And um, at the time, 
I was hanging out with like some of my friends from like high school or like pre before high school. Um, and ended up meeting this guy that was just like looking for some packs and shit. And so just put two and two together and started serving him with the shit that I was getting from my relative. And my relative was just kind of surprised with like how fast I was like moving this shit. Cause like, I never really sold you prior to that other than like, you know, maybe like buying an ounce and like selling some sacks to my friends to smoke for free. Um, and so he had brought me back to his spot and showed me just like more weed than I've ever seen before. And kind of just like rug it down to me what he was doing. And um, that was probably like my introduction into like the weed game. Yeah, like the weed game. And uh, that was like 04. And like Canadian weed was like super big in the area at the time. There was like really like only like two different types of weed. Because like strain names weren't really like a thing back then in the streets. Um, but there was like Canadian weed and loke right and loke is like short for local and it's kind of just like a generic term that people in like the seattle area use right for like just like dank weed that's grown locally like you dub yeah you know or even like like how like out here at least like humble was just like a really like generic term for better than bc for sure like just dank yeah. weed that came out of like northern california agree right Typically greenhouse, like nice sure. greenhouse. No, yeah, for sure. It was, that yeah. smelled better than BC, but like basically looked a little bit better than BC yep. buds, but smelled and tasted way better. Yeah, and there was like the different grades of BC bud too, right? Because like, so most of like the Asians out here, they they were dealing with like like what people know as beasters, right? Like weed that like looks good but has no fucking smell to it or smells like grass. Or hay because they were trying to drive too fast. Um, I got, let me go to Bud. Yeah. <laughs> or um, then there was like the mango, grapefruits, right? Which was like the grade generally didn't really matter as long as it had that smell and taste. Like that was like the next step above the beasters. And they come to find out that shit's actually like uh, this strain called dynamite. And. Um, yeah, so there was this uh there was this uh this company brand out here um called TKO. And um they were pretty popular up here during the medical days and then I think they ended up moving to Oregon. But they grew I don't know if they still do, but they I remember they grew the dynamite and I remember smoking it one time and I was like, yo, this is like this smells exactly like the mango slash grapefruit that used to come from Canada all the time. So there was like those, those were like the two main grades. And then you had like really good Canadian weed that generally came from the bikers. Um, pretty much, you know, cause they like, they knew how to grow good weed. Well, they, so I actually went to Canada a few times, yeah. right? Cause I was thinking about moving up there. Um, with my citizenship shit, I can move up there and think about moving there to grow weed and do breeding mm -hmm. um, early in my career. And I went to Vancouver Island. I went and stayed with Reefer Man and Sea Ray um, for like a week one time and went and saw a few other people in Victoria and Nanaimo. Mm -hmm. And what I saw in terms of how the business works up there is that there was basically all a bunch of local people, right, that would grow 20 lights basically. And there were, there were crews of guys that knew how to build grows. And basically if you were interested in growing people, they would basically finance or help start up your grow. And then they would just come, come and keep buying the weed off of you. Yeah. It wasn't really like, it didn't really seem very forced mm -hmm. or um, very gang related at all. Yeah. It was more just, we're going to help set people up with a nice, like basically what most of the time what I saw is like, basically what looked like a double wide on top of a deep basement mm -hmm. like a deep foundation right and that's usually what they did they'd come in dig out a deep basement run a cinder block 
foundation, but make it extra tall and then mm -hmm. literally pop a double wide um, or a manufactured home on top of it. And you could put, um, you know, two 10 light or two 20 light rooms in there. Yeah. And that was like a pretty common setup. And, it, you know, every I saw everybody from like 18 year old kids straight out of high school with houses like that yep. to like 70 year old ladies living in the house and they work the garden too. They go in there and water plants and shit. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, there was local guys that like, you know, work through the grow stores or just, you know, kind of local crews of just growers mm -hmm. and the same thing trimmers. It was like pretty, pretty well organized and lots of just small groups. And then the bikers would come and just buy it all, Ooh, you know, okay. cheap back at the time, 1500 bucks. Yeah. A pound. Then even fifteen hundred Canadian. Yeah, so they probably had a better. Now that you put it like that, they probably had like a better frame of reference as to what good weed was. Absolutely, right? Because everybody was growing all kinds of other shit too. That's really good. That's the number four. Oh, for real? Yeah, oh, that was no. good. Let's see. So, but, but yeah, there was lots of people growing different stuff in all those houses, you know, especially when you, like when I saw Reefer Man, cause he grew lots of different stuff and they'd have everything from like, you know, the Burmese fucking incredible type stuff to just King Bud, which was like just a real cushy hash planting smelling thing, mm -hmm. well, which smelled really similar to Weedzilla's HP number one. If there, anybody ever remembers that guy's stuff. Um, wasn't very well distributed, but it was known online. But, uh, at the time that was kind of the, you know, that was kind of the scene up here. It was like either local good herb yeah. that may or may not have a name, but if it did have a name, that's usually what it was. Yep. Um, or BC bud. And there really wasn't, um, brick weed up here at all. No. The first um, time I saw that shit was when I was in high school. I think I was. In Sacramento. Well, actually, so when I first moved to Sacramento, right, I had uh, one of my little cousins. Um, I just asked him. He's like a few years younger than me, but I was like, you know anybody that like be smoking? And uh, he's like, yeah, I'll hook you up with like my homie. And he sold me like a sack of some fucking bammer. Right. But it was like it was like in a little dime bag, like a dime bag in Sacramento. Yeah. Which like in Sacramento at the time. Like good weed, like a 10 sack was like half a gram. So they used to come in like the tiny, tiny fucking little square bags. But like he sold me like, it was like a fat pillow in that size baggie. But it was straight bammer. It was like some brick weed that had been like fluffed out. Yeah, decompressed. Right? Yeah, so there's like hella seeds. I'm just like, like, yo, I, I like call dudes. I'm like, what the fuck is this shit? Like, this isn't weed. Like, right? Um, I mean, he probably thought that I just didn't know shit, you know? Yeah. Cause like, that was probably all he had access to. Right. But no, so <laughs> like, I don't know if it was the next day, but like shortly after he was like, okay, I'll take you to where like, the, like there's good okay. weed. He's like, but it's like dangerous. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> man, I'm just like, oh, all right, fuck it. Right. I'm like, you know, how dangerous can it be? So he brings me to fucking G Parkway. And so if you're from Sacramento, right. If like you've been there, so this is like 99. And I believe like the the apartment complex and property or whatever is still there, but like it's been like they changed the name and like I don't think it's like like a lot of the former residents probably got like displaced and shit. But like if you know about G Parkway, like you know it's fucking dangerous as fuck, right? <laughs> but like it was, man. You like you go in and. You'd have to know some at the time. You'd have to know somebody that lived there because there was just so much fucking drug traffic and so much shit going on that they like hire a security guard at like a fucking booth and it was like you know. They need to know what gate. store you're going to. You no, know, you need to like you need to know exactly like who lives there and what apartment number is it and what right? drugs you're buying. Um, but no, so like we go, we walk up in there and like you know we hit this like back alley and shit, and there's just like multiple people that just like. You know, it's like, it's like in the movies or like in TV shows, like in the wire and shit, like you pull up somewhere and you got hella people running at your car trying to sell you some shit. It's like that as you're like walking down the alley, everybody's trying to sell you some weed, you know, but you're just like, no, nah, I'm like going here. I like, I, I know this guy over here. And then, then they'll like leave you alone. If you like know somebody specific, but I guess they get a lot of people that just roll through there trying to just, you know, but 
Yeah, that was like my introduction to good weed in Sacramento. But they used to have like just dank fucking lots of different flavors. Shit didn't have a name, but super dank. Um, yeah, fucking. But no, oh, so the brick weed. The first time I saw brick weed was in in L.A. or like Orange County. Mm. I went down there in like 2000, 2000, yeah, 2016. So yeah, 2000 um, with some of my friends and, you know, a similar situation like G Parkway, you know, you're just like, you hit a fucking, you hit the projects and you go into the back alley and usually there's like people there and um, just got some weed from some Mexican dude, which was like wrapped up in like a piece of a fucking grocery bag, just like tied <laughs> up in a ball, right? And it's just, you open it up and it's just straight, straight fucking like just brown, compressed, hella seeds, hella stems. Unidentifiable. Fucking, you know, smells like whatever they had to like wrap the package in to smuggle that shit. Yeah. Shit was terrible. Yeah. I didn't have much experience with it because I grew up in Virginia, but I didn't really grow up smoking weed in Virginia. I didn't, I started smoking weed here in Washington. And, uh, I met Jeff, you know, when I was like 17, you know, so, and I was already buying weed through him basically th- th- for the year prior, you yeah. know? So pretty much was only experienced a good weed. But when I'd go back to, for those two years in high school, when I was smoking weed, when I'd go back to Virginia, I'd go and try and buy some weed and it was just bad. I, I mean, I remember, uh, I went on a cruise ship with my mom yeah, cause she's a travel agent. It was just like some event that she was doing and I smuggled weed on the thing and like got a fucking Cuban cigar when I was in uh, the Bahamas Yeah, and then like rolled a blunt and I found these other kids on the boat somehow that um, also had weed <laughs> and like it was, it was actually kind of cool. It was, yeah. I was surprised, but we were smoking straight brick weed <laughs> and it, it was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, fuck. I was like, yeah. Yeah, I remember what I did like before we uh, took the um, cruise was I uh, spread all the weed out, right? Broke it all down so that there was no stems and seeds in it Mm -hmm. so that I would only have like broken down weed that was easy to smoke so that I could roll it up real easy on the boat Yeah, and find like usually what I'd find is the like staff deck area where they'd smoke cigarettes and go down there and smoke weed. (laughs) So yeah, that was my, so yeah, so like you were saying, like there really wasn't any brick weed in in like Seattle. Uh, if you had it, area. you wouldn't have been able to sell it, probably. I don't think so. Because basically, the worst weed that was around here, and I gotta show you, I basically recreated the Beaster Terp. <laughs> <laughs> Granted, every pheno hunt has a Beaster fucking plant in it. Yeah. Um, or two, but uh, nice big bricked out fucking frosty weed that actually smokes fine but has that what i would call the musty yeah musty dusty gelato turp <laughs> shit man granted put it the, in a, the put beaster it in a, uh, is like bag. that turp but with like cardboard whereas just the musty gelato is just it's just the musty gelato smell but yeah fucking yeah, that was like what I knew as far as weed up until, well, there even, so aside from like the Canadian, the Lokes, there was also like the Perps, right? Which sometimes Perps could be Loke because it could be locally grown, but it was also in its like a, just a, a separate class, right? And so Perp, Perp was like a really popular thing in my circle or just for me personally too, just like consuming wise up until like maybe 2000, like seven, 2008. That's when like Kush started to slowly make its way onto the black market out here. Mm-hmm. So you would see some like Kush packs that came from Canada, some that would come from California. And, um, I mean, rarely did it like have like a prefix, right? That like at least that coming from the, from the dealer. It would just be Kush. You know, sometimes you would have, like, the coffee, creamy tasting one. Sometimes you'd have, like, the grapey, you know, incense tasting one. 
And some you'd, sometimes you'd have the one that tasted like diesel, which, you know, now I know is like the OG. Um, but you just, you know, it just came as Kush. And so it was like perp, then like granddaddy towards the end of that purple phase, then the Kush. And, um, and the perp you're talking about is like the purple indica, the UW perp. Yeah, like right? the Seattle, the like the local. Violet. Um, Jeff and I were talking about it. Yeah. Kind of its history. I mean, I've I've met people that have smoked that weed and they've they're like, I used to buy this in the late eighties. It's that old and that it was that popular and that common in this area. Yeah. I mean, I didn't see it the first time that I saw it, I saw like Okay, so like Perp has always been around, not always, but I mean, just as far as long as I've been smoking, like Perp and Blueberry have always been around Seattle, but like, I would say, so the first time that I smoked the one that reminds me the most of the Purple Indica was like 2005. Um, I was living in Mill Creek at the time with my uncle, and he used to get this weed that he called UW from one of his buddies that like DJs locally. And that's the one that reminds me of the Shrom, like the most, right? It's yeah, like the lemon bomb we used to fucking, call that one too. You know, that shit was like just a very distinct shade of like highlighter, yellowish green, mm-hmm. um like lemon lime, skunk pine. And um back then they used to not even trim it. Right, like the it wouldn't have fan leaves on it, but all like the sugar leaves um, would still be on there, and so it had a very distinctive look to it. And probably like the second time that we had bought that weed from his homie, and it never came in large quantities. Like the most we get is like a quarter pound, right? You just like buy ounces and shit. But like the second time we got it, we were able to get like a quarter pound of the UW, and then a quarter pound of this perp, right? And it, I mean. You could tell it came from the same grower because, like, it was trimmed the same. It came around the same, like, it came at the same time, you know, from the same people. But it was just, like, just straight black. Like, just super dark perp. But it was definitely different than, like, you know, Grape Ape Urkel Granddaddy. Like, totally different flavor profile. Like, um, but yeah, so that was, like, my first time smoking the perp that reminds me the most of the purple indica and mm-hmm. it and it came at the same time or from the same person as the U what we know as the UW which reminds me of the Shrom. So I used to buy like probably the same weed or same group of people. Mm-hmm. But the UW one you're talking about, some people would call it UW but it would also be called Lemon Bomb. Yeah. Right. And then obviously the the UW perp or the perp. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't even I didn't ever hear anybody call it purple indica. Yeah. That was why I actually called that clone purple indica because when I received that, um, that clone, uh, which Jeff and I talked about, <laughs> it was through the Oregon medical scene and it didn't come with a name, mm-hmm. right? So I had no idea what it was. And then once I had grown it, I realized it was related to one of these like purples I'd bought bags of. Right, so I was like, "Well, fuck, what I call it?" Well, it's super fucking small plant, and the only like mention I'd heard of a name of a strain called purple indica was like some Canadian outdoor shit or something, and I was like, "Dude, they're not," you know. So PI, as far as I knew, wasn't even like a term for the perp, mm-hmm. like you're saying. It was always perp, ultraviolet, or um, that was it. Really. Yeah. Usually we would just call it like Seattle Perp or like yeah. you know, it was like prefixes for us back then and we're usually like the area that the weed where it's like came 100%. from. Hundred percent. You know. That's or, why U Dub was such a popular term. Exactly. It didn't matter really what weed. I mean yeah, there's the guy I got that San Diego cat piss from, uh Philly. Yeah. He um he used to bring me like bags of the trim of this other U dub strain they had that was like really it was kinda like Sensi Star. It was like that bordering with almost a train wrecky kind of smell but mostly like this really thick medical dank smell Mm -hmm. it's like you know hashy dank medical or like medicine like smell with a tiny train wreck to it you know but it was really good made great hash (coughs) 
and uh, he called that UW. Yeah. Like, you know, I don't think that was necessarily what strain it was or if there was an original strain. And the same thing kind of like, you know, everybody has this story that there's like the any like a UW strain that came from the actual university itself. The cancer fucking research. <laughs> uh, that's all a bunch of horse shit. I yeah. think too. I haven't, I've, you know, I used to have this other friend that was down Bury and that sweared his, swore his UW clone, which is actually the one that like everybody you see online using nowadays is like the UW black, which came on during like the, uh, Northwest green thumb days, which that's so far after. I don't really know who knows what that was. Yeah. But the other one was this like big green kind of fat butted plant, kind of that medicinal smell, like the one that Philly showed me. Mm-hmm. I used to buy, but it wasn't, it wasn't that good, you know. Kind of had that beaster box smell, yeah. and it's just like anything that that had a hint of beaster, even if you grew it really good. Yeah, I threw that shit in the trash every time. Like for, for me, it was like if I got and I got grip of those flown through the years i mean so many you know keeper cuts of whatever and it's just like man if it if it's just kind of mild on the smell and flavor i'm not going to keep it yeah i might run it for production if at that time i knew someone that wanted it but i'm not going to put a lot of energy into it for its breeding stock i mean the same i kind of had the same experience with like pretty much a lot of the stuff i bought from canada and from europe you know, it was just like none of it really had that significant of a smell and flavor, which is what drove me to collect American clone only varieties while they were still around. Yeah. Um, but I've, I've had a couple things. For, I, I would say if I had a choice, like if it was like if I was growing back then, and I had a choice. I'd probably pick Canadian seeds over Dutch seeds from that time in particular. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I mean, I actually just recently grew out like the v- majority of all my old seeds that I bought from back then, just to run through them. And man, I didn't find much. I just put it that way. Yeah, well, but, I, mean, I just but, that. I, but I would agree that the stuff that I grew from the Canadian varieties were more productive and commercially appealing than a lot of the stuff that I got from Amsterdam. I guess I say that just because of like the blue seed easel. Like that's from Canada, yeah. And that shit's uh, well, actually not because I like cheese too. So yeah, never mind. Well, <laughs> I think I, I think at that, that time in the early two thousands in particular, yeah, because the Canadian scene, Mark Emery's scene, and everything was so hot and big at the time, that there was more people growing more plants and breeding with them there, than probably in Amsterdam at the time, because you know Amsterdam's kind of had a it's it's hard to get a lot of space in the Netherlands to like do big cultivation or run through lots of plants. Cultivation's always been illegal there, still is. Mm-hmm. And I just don't think the scale at which um, they they were able to do things, uh, you know, just American shit. We just do shit bigger here in general. We got more space. We got more land. We got more power. We got everything yeah. bigger because we have a bigger infrastructure because the country is that much bigger. And so I think a lot of the, especially at that time, there was just more, more people making seeds and making selections. And uh, because Mark Emery basically had an unbelievable demand yeah. for seeds um, because no one in the Netherlands was willing to ship to America at that time. Which is also why Gypsy Nirvana at Seeds Direct in the UK mm-hmm. did so amazingly well at that time as well he was one of maybe three people you could go online from america and order seeds from and they'd get delivered and uh you know his his business was buying seeds from americans and selling them back to us that was and so was um heaven stairway richard bagdadlian overgrow cannabis world all the early forums that was the whole business was (laughs) <laughs> using the internet to bring everybody together as a place that people that were isolated growers and bring them all into one place and essentially spread genetics was the main result of most of that. I mean, a lot of people created friendships and stuff out of it too, but yeah, um, it was a lot of it was formed around genetics and preservation of all that stuff. 
Um, speaking of which, the BCD, that's the one parent in Smarties. Yep. The other being um, Cookies, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so, so what's kind of your story? When did you make that thing? Um, man, I'd have to go back and really see. But I, if I had to just suggest off the top of my head, like 2012, <clears throat> 2012, maybe the end of 12, beginning of 13 is when I went and got the cookies from uh, my homie J.O. in the Bay, who <clears throat> he told me it was like the original Thin Mint. And, um, you know, he, he's got a he's got a good relationship with Jigga from back when he um, had a dispensary in Vallejo. And he had access to like just a lot of like strains that were just hype and rare at the time um because like back then like so like why and all that kind of stuff too. yeah the sherb um like the original sunset sherb that was like flintstone push pop flavor and the cherry pie you've told <clears throat> me about before yeah he i don't know if he had that one but like um my frame of reference for cherry pie is definitely different than the one that floated around the Northwest. But, um, yeah, like 2012, 2013, I met J.O. and he had um, sold me that cut of the Thin Mints. And, like, I mean, prior to that, you know, I just saw, like, a lot of forum cookies and OGKB on, like, IC Mag, and then slowly seeing it in, like, you know, the farmer's markets and the dispensaries out here. And, um, you know, I always thought that it just, like, looked really good. It just didn't really taste that great. And I was working in this medical dispensary called Herbal Choice um, out here in Kent. And um, this vendor used to bring in this Blue City Diesel dude from Oregon. And um, he used to just bring in this dank-ass Blue City Diesel that was just, like, it was always super tasty. And, um, but it just didn't really have the bag appeal to it. You know I mean? It's like, it, it's like, it's got good color, but like, it didn't have that like exotic look like how cookies has. And so I was like, man, let me like, I wonder if I just like breed these two strains together. If I can get something that like tastes like blue city diesel, but looks like cookies. All right. That was like my goal. And so, um, I want to say like the first or second time that I grew the cookies, I just re I reversed. Um, I had reversed one of the plants that I had, and then just dusted like a little bottom branch of the blue city diesel. And then from that, I got like I don't know, maybe like a dozen seeds or something, and popped six of them, and then. One was the Smarties, one was the Aria, one was my version of Gushers, and then the other one, the other two I threw away, but I gave one to um, Motodon on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, I had gave him a cut of that. It was like a throwaway thing, though, but I mean, he grew it out for a little bit and people seem to like it, like flavor wise. I think he's calling it like the Fruit Loops or some shit. But, um, yeah, so that's the cookies, the Thin Mint cookies from J.O. That's like, um. That's the pollen donor. Yep. And then Blue City Diesel, which it's, is that clone right there. Yeah, that's the, that's the receiver that I got from, through the dispensary um, that I used to work at from, you know, this older dude out of Oregon and like the blue city Which is diesel most likely Jordan of the islands. Oh, it's for sure. Stock. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. It's Jordan of the islands from, uh, from Canada. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, this female blue city diesel is definitely, it's, it's pretty well known in Oregon. Um, I've yeah. seen it, I've seen it from a couple of different people. Um, but it's also, there's like a, there's a female blue city diesel that I've seen in NorCal. That's like way different though. Mm -hmm. It looks a lot better. But um, not as good flavor when you smoke the weed. Like that's and how one, would you describe the terps of the Blue City Diesel? Uh, definitely like you get like slight blueberry overtones when it's done right, and then 
that heavy, heavy, like red grapefruit that the New York City Diesel is known for. Mm-hmm. Um, Still citrusy. Yeah. But but kind of bitter too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it doesn't have any of like the weird cheesy poopy kind of funk that sometimes you get with tangy. Yeah. So I know like when yeah, people think citrus, part of it. Yeah. when people think citrus, you know, they're just like their frame of reference is usually tangy. Yeah. Which has some of the weird shit on the back end. But the blue seed diesel to me doesn't have that. It's just like slight blueberry overtone when it's done right. And then just that New York City diesel red grapefruit flavor to it. Mm-hmm. The Soma NYC. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> pretty good um tastes good bag of pill isn't really that great um it throws down though in the garden and it makes interesting hybrids yeah so one thing about it is that <clears throat> it's um it has really strong branches it's, it's pretty good growing plant mm-hmm. right the bcd um it's maybe a little stocky right but yeah. the, the nice thing about the hybrids is that they often carry that same um growth characteristic growth characteristic and also another characteristic that comes out is auto flowering definitely in yeah the, the uh the hybrids so you know while cookies and the blue city diesel themselves don't have any issues with um auto flowering you do get in the hybrids like yeah the smarties if it's uh in too small of a pot or if it starts to get like a bit rude bad, i guess it'll like trigger that auto flowering and the gushers was really heavy auto-flowering. yeah that's why that's why i never really kept it around i gave it to my cousin to hold on to me for me just in case but yeah i, I grew it a couple around. times too and just same thing yeah um if I you fed it really heavy seeds, huh? if you fed it really heavy it yeah. would like try to not out of auto yeah flower. <laughs> yeah i would always have to just like constantly just like up you know uh, up pot it or whatever yeah. but um I found a bunch of like phenols that have that same blueberry gushers fruit snacks flavor, and um, some of so one of the other phenols from the Blue City Diesel Cookies Cross, it didn't have a name, so I just named it like it just had BCC on it for Blue City Cookies, mm-hmm. but that one was like the more like fruit punch kind of smelly one that uh, Max ended up making some auto flower seeds with. Oh right. For the outdoor. Yeah. Um, so I popped some seeds of that um, across to the cookies. And um, I found a lot of those, like, just blueberry gushers fruit snacks kind of, you know. So, yeah, I never really worried about, like, getting back home back to my cousin. Because it's just something that was so common in that, in the seeds that I have. Yeah. Um, speaking of other strains that you've made, so when you did the, um, Smarties, you also did, made the White Tahoe Cookies. Yeah. So, which has, you know, now become pretty popular, pretty famous. You know, people grow it all over the country. We, you know, once we started selling clones of it. Yeah, definitely that release through the store, um, brought a lot of recognition to that strain and the brand. And it's, it's a great little plant to, you know, it's kind of short, it's kind of, uh, good for like a home grower. It's got that cushy, cookie, you know, smell and taste. And yeah, um, and you made both generations of that. So you all you made the white Tahoe, yeah, right? So. And that was like also the the Wubba hash that you originally, um, uh, you know, I smoked from you when we first met. And speaking of which, I, I found some seeds of it, right? Of some Wubbas. Um, definitely need those. Yep, yeah, and. Uh, so you had you had gotten the white clone and a Tahoe G. Yeah. So the clone of the white came from a farmer's market um, on the north side of South Lake Yuma, or the north side of Lake Yuma. Um, there was this. There was like an art gallery there, and they just had like a random farmer's market one week. And um, I came across this guy's booth, and he had, like, you know, a menu. And on there it said, 
clones of the white. You know, he had the flower there of the clone that he grew. And I mean, it, like, I've never seen the white prior to that, but I was, you know, going off of my frame of reference, which was IC Mag. I was like, these nugs, like, look the part. It kind of smell like, you know, what everybody's description of it is. So I was like, all right, fuck it. Like, you know, I was like, do you have any clones of it? And he was like, oh, I sold, like, the last ones that I had. I was like, man, is there any way that I could, like, you know, reach out to you, get it from you another day? So, dude, gives me his Facebook and, um, fucking forgot the guy's name but he was like and he's like a burning man kind of guy but like back then burning man kind of yeah. guy right before it became i guess like commercialized and super hip he's earthy yeah real earthy yep yeah. <laughs> but um so yeah i ended up like just messaging him on facebook and then like maybe like two or three months later he finally came through with the clone the Tahoe OG. Man, where the fuck did I get that one from? I want to say that I got it from. I forgot the year, but it was like the beginning of the medical scene. There was this dispensary in Columbia City. They had another one, too, up uh, on Aurora next to the stereo warehouse. That came like another like a year or two after, but. It was these two brothers from Studio City, right? And I just remember seeing their ad on Northwest Green Thumb. They were, like, posting the dispensary menu. And they had just all different, like, types of OGs and shit and, like, chems and diesels. And they had clones. I was like, oh, shit. Like, let me go see if, like, these guys are legit. Let me see if these flowers actually smell like real OG. Mm -hmm. Then I'll, I'll trust their fucking... Uh, the selection of clones that they have for sale. And so I went down there. The shit was legit. And I bought two clones from them. A private reserve and some Tahoe OG. And um, I grew them both out. And the Tahoe was just like a little bit more vigorous. But um, the private reserve, I ended up giving to somebody. He didn't keep it. But so at that time, um, OG Rascal Seeds even like a little bit before then, but OG Rascal Seeds were like super popular. Like all the white hybrids, you know, just from like seeing on the internet, right? Like white Bubba, White Fire, like that shit became super popular, especially through like Jungle Boys and shit yeah. with the 43. But um, like I said at the time, I wasn't internet savvy about with buying seeds and shit. I just didn't trust sending my money to somebody and, you know, or even how to go about how to receive them. Joining an auction, getting a mail to like, man, I was just. So I was like, you know what? Let me just. Okay, how do people make seeds and shit, right? And then figure out like feminizing shit. Because, you know, as like a, like a grower, you don't want male plants. You know, if you're not a breeder, you don't want male plants. You just. You want to grow plants that will like, you know, produce flowers and shit. So the regular seeds never really, was like really like a a thing for me so i'll just look up the feminizing shit and you know um seen how to make silver thiosulfate and then sprayed the white and cross that to uh everything that i had which was like the chem 4 the pre-98 bubba the tahoe and i think i might have had one more but those were like the three that i remember doing was like the white Chem 4, white Bubba, and the white Tahoe. And then out of the white Tahoe, I popped six seeds. The number six was the keeper. And that's what I crossed to the cookies that I got from J.O. to make the white Tahoe cookies. And then even out of that, it just popped like six seeds. And then there was like two phenols that I kept. One was like a green pheno that um, I gave to like one person, but I never kept it myself. And then the number six was the White Tahoe cookie. What what people know as the White Tahoe cookies now, which actually almost got thrown away, like <laughs> which uh, happens all the time. Right? Plants other, you know, plants you just can't keep, and you know would like to see them go to a better home, but there's not always a better home to send them to. Yeah, and so I was gonna throw it away, and then uh, you know Fletch was like, "Shit, just give it to me. I'll clean it up," and you know gave it to him. And he brought it, you know, back to peak health. 
and you know that he um, made the proposition to like distribute it through the store. And that's shit. I was, I was like, sure, you know, it seemed like a good idea. And yeah, it's been pretty cool to see how well received that was at the time, and um, how many people like like that strain and actually like grow it still. Yeah, people grow it all over the country, and. You know, there's dozens of seed companies <clears throat> that have used it in their work as well. Yeah. You know? um, so, I mean, you know, you've made your mark. And, and like with the Smarties, it while it hasn't been distributed, you did a, a deal with Connected in California where yeah. they grew the Smarties um, for a while. And, yeah. um, you know, I, that also created some exposure for the strain and everything. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, they've got like a crazy consumer base. So they're the big, two biggest flower brands in California. I think, yeah. Right now. So you know that was definitely like a good look. Um, partnering up with, with Connected and uh, letting them grow the Smarties for a bit. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to see that you know things get grown and um, and you know see people consume them. You know, it's it, sure. it seems like nowadays. People don't even care about growing the weed and like getting a high quality new product to the consumer. It seems like half or more than half the people, like especially if you look at Instagram and stuff, are just like looking to get a clone so they can hustle the clone to some people. They don't yeah. even want to grow out the clone themselves. They don't even care about like <clears throat> whether or not the clone's any good or try to make anything with it. They're literally just in the hustle of trying to provide genetics to somebody whether it's going to help their business or not capitalizing on hype yeah and i i think something earlier that i i wanted to 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 interject but i wanted to let you finish earlier was about um how like the main thing was always about you got samples of that shit Right. right whatever fucking clone someone's trying to like do a deal with you on or yeah. give you or it's like well I don't really care what you're talking about. Just show me some samples. If you can show me some samples, I, I don't need any more proof. And yeah, I, think I need that's, to know what I'm getting myself into. Yeah, like, I think that's something that's lost on, like, kind of the the current generation of growers and stuff is, like, how can you want to take the risk of wasting time, resources, energy, and your hopes, potentially, if you're looking for a specific strain, on growing a plant that may be infected yeah. with a disease that can ruin your garden. It can take up space that you don't need it to. And, um, and it's not what you're looking for. And so I, I think it's always important. It's like, it's all about busting out the box of jars, you know, yeah. that's what it's about. Just box, bust out the box of jars and let's look at the samples. And I, I think that if you're in the business of genetics at all, if you can't bust out the jars, you you're really not doing anybody any service. Yeah, red you know? flag, <laughs> red flag. It should be a red flag if you, if they can't because it's like, are you a grower or do you just do you just hustle shit? You know. Yeah. And and at the end of the day, as the as the buyer or consumer, which both of us have been and still are consumers of genetics, <coughs> I still buy seeds and grow them out. Yeah. That aren't mine, and. Uh, you know, I if I can't trust the person it's coming from, it's it's more of a risk to even um, even try. Yeah. Especially if you're talking about receiving clones that with, you know, all the diseases going around nowadays to be particularly concerned of. But e even back then, I mean, there was a couple clones. I remember there was um, this strain called Coral Reef. Mm hmm. And I can't remember what the other one was, but I was trying to get it from this guy in California. He can't, he was from Seattle originally. He brought him up, and he brought and he had the clones in rock roll like three inch blocks. And I look at them, and they're covered in um, thrips and have powdery mildew. And I was just like, dude, I can't take these things. Yeah. I don't have anywhere to like take this and take the risk. And uh, that was like two thousand and five. Yeah. And it's, and, uh, you know, at that time, we just didn't know as much about eradicating those pests. And it was such a risk to want to, to risk infecting the rest of my mother room. 
Yeah. Even that early on in my career, I still had a pretty decent sized mother room I was already collecting. And, uh, you know, that strain isn't worth it, but I, I wish I had it. Cause that was like, that shit was kind of like Skittles before Skittles. Mm -hmm. It was that real yeah. hand soap, potpourri, crazy smell. Yeah. Um, that shit was awesome. Speaking of powdery mildew, I remember the first time I saw that shit. I was like, it was like when I first started growing with that Vietnamese guy. And I just remember like coming into the room one day, you know, about like beginning a flower and just seeing like all these white spots on the fucking plants. I'm just like, what the fuck is this? Like, like go to the internet, like look some shit up. I'm like, fuck, like I don't want to spray no crazy shit on my plants and uh came across like this other like it's like a milk solution or something uh, you know Ed like, Rosenthal you know what i'm talking about yeah, it's like a one, it's Ed like Rosenthal. milk and something it's like okay yeah. like this doesn't seem as bad but man it like left the room smelling super weird and funky <laughs> after a few days like <laughs> fuck man the things that i used to like the things that i like learned on the internet at the beginning of my growing career there's a lot of bad information out there. Oh, for sure. And especially like, you know, everybody knows somebody that knows something about growing weed. Even if they don't grow weed themselves, right? Some Everybody knows something. They try to like tell you, like, oh, man, you should do this. You should try this. For me, it's the same thing, though. Yeah. Show me that jar of weed. <laughs> if you can't show me that dank ass jar of weed. Yeah. It's just kind of like, I'll listen and I'll have a conversation, but I really am not going to take a whole lot of like, I'm not going to get a whole lot out of it because it's like, you know, it's like discussing something, but the other person doesn't understand where we're supposed to end, end up. Yeah. It's like, dude, you still are smoking crappy weed and you gr you've been growing 20 years. This is a problem. Like, your sure. there's a problem with your methodology. And like, as soon as I see someone shows me, a, you know, awesome weed, it's like, what do you do? Yeah. What do you, what kind of shit are you using? What kind of nutrients are you using? I mean, that's pretty much usually what you see in a group of people of growers showing jars, whoever has the best jars, everyone's going to start asking them, what do you grow in? Yeah. What's your nutrient formula? Can I come take a look at your shit? <laughs> do you sure have any organics in this? To learn. <laughs> so that's, um, that's always part of it is, uh, I think that's the biggest part of it is just showing up with the, with the dank jar of weed. And I think that's, that's just, being lost on the new generation where just show me the bag on Instagram. That's the new show me your jar of weed. And, and it's, it, you know, there are a few events where people are trying to, um, to bring all these products together and stuff, but it's still kind of focused on the same, the same core group of people. Yeah. It's not really offering stuff for everybody. You don't have like sativa categories where people are even promoting that type of stuff. I mean, I, I was watching like the Gypsy Nirvana interview that mm -hmm. was on the podcast or listening to it. And uh, he made a good point that like a lot of that sativa stuff is, you know, like Super Silver Haze and Malawi and El Haze and all these other things that we have. Mm -hmm. Today's consumers, they just, they don't it's such a racier different high for them that they just can't deal with it. They're so their expectations for weed is like what a pen does basically. Yeah. Right. To just be um, relaxing. Yeah. That that's like a lot of people's um, idea of being high. Exactly. Is like the, the down feeling, right. The relax, just like mellowed out feeling. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, for sure, a lot of people probably wouldn't like the uh, the more racy, cerebral kind of high. It'd but I think be, people are missing out on a lot because they're not experiencing that, and for sure, you know, learning from it, so to speak. Yeah, um, but maybe not. I, don't I mean, know. I think I still grow a lot of haze and haze type hybrids and sativas. Like, yeah. I like having a jar of really well grown strom around. Have you it's smoked? Awesome. Have you smoked any of like, uh, like the uh, the haze that like East Coast people have a frame of reference of? 
No, like the Piff and all that. Right, yeah. No, um, but I mean like they – how they've described it and from what people I know that do know it that have seen like the Malawi and L. Mm-hmm. It's like that type of smell. Malawi and L. Okay. Haze type of you – know, Yeah. Pe- what like, I call the green haze yeah. smell. A lot of people describe it as like a church smell, right? Which is like, okay, like – yeah. I, I don't know what a church smells like. Frankincense-y. Yeah. So, yeah. so then they're like, yeah, like incense-y. Yeah. Incense-y. Mothball. Yeah. That's uh, it. Yeah. I'd say the Malawi and L is more like metallic mm-hmm. side of that, but it's still in the same realm. Yeah. The pure Malawi, um, you know, the Shram is like up that same alley. But not quite. You, did you see the big sir that we have? That clone? I think so. You know, kind of that kind of smell too. Yeah. Just all kind of variations of haze, just like there's variations of OG. Yeah. I mean, I think maybe people would enjoy like maybe some of like subcool type shit, TGA type shit, where it's like sativa, but with like different like flavors, right? Yeah. Like, Man, I remember smoking this Chernobyl that was like a cherry lime Slurpee. Shit tasted so fucking good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've smoked a lot of shit from TJ that I actually pretty like. I liked a lot. Yeah. Fucking, um, I mean, they made a lot of stuff. Uh, you know? Like Jilly Bean. Yeah. I remember smoking like an orange creamsicle tasting Fina. I mean, that's all that tangy. good. Yeah. It's just... Um, that same line of that Melvin orange velvet stuff. Just Tangy in the like 2013 high times mm-hmm. uh, where they interview Crockett. He says that um, in the magazine, he says that he got orange velvet seeds from Oregon. And that's how he started making um, Tangy. And that's at the time, that's where TJ was based out of, right? Correct. And uh, Orange Velvet was the name that Jill gave to that Melvin clone. So she had come across this clone called Melvin Mm -hmm. in Oregon that was really orangey from some local grower there. And when they made the first line with it, I think they called it Orange Velvet. And then I think they also made an Orange Velvet BX1. But I think that line had a lot of Hermes in it. Mm Mm-hmm. And they abandoned that project and then did Jelly Bean and all the other um, oranges. And, I, you know, my timeline might not be perfect there, right? Sorry, Jill, if it's not right. But I think they do deserve credit for um, basically stirring, reinvigorating the entire orange tangy phenomenon for that's sure. happened over the last 10 years. Because... There's still people using tangy plants mm-hmm. and making their whole brand off of it. Now, Isn't that right? I mean, like forbidden the... fruit is just a purple tangy pheno, yeah. basically, what right? It's the... a hybrid of it, but it's the same thing. With the Tropicana, Tropicana cookies yeah. is just another tangy. Um, then you've got tangy itself. Um, who else made a really like a purple? Like the what's interesting to me is how everybody got reinterested in the purple tangy fino even though crockett had already found the purple tangy fino and that was like a thing for a minute yeah you know it's like every year there's a new tangy lover that doesn't remember tangy last year i I mean i guess if you remake it enough times people think it's new but um, color to it that's what it seems like make it look a little better it's new (laughs) I mean, Forbidden Fruits, I, I guess, got enough of a little different terp to it yeah. that it's... Uh, I can't say I've tried it, but... but I don't like smoking it. Yeah. Same thing with, like, Blackberry. You remember the Blackberry? Yeah. Mendo Perp? Yeah. Same deal. It's like, they smell awesome. Man, there was this Black Rhino that this uh this guy in, like, I think, like, Longview or Kelso he used to grow. He used to bring it to the farmer's market. That shit was fire. Like, Blackberry, White Rhino. It's mm-hmm. like... That shit actually tasted like a fucking bag of Skittles. Like, So I got a clone from Ken. And it was that black rhino crossed with uh, Bubba. You know what's crazy? The guy that I'm talking about that brought the weed to the farmer's market, his name was Ken. 
but I don't think it's the same person. But I it, don't think so. His shit was called Ken's Medicine Bowl. Yeah. So yeah, just crazy But the thing is, is so what people don't kind of remember is there was this guy online. His name was, um, I don't know, his online handle was Paradise Seeds Mod. Right? I can't remember his name right now. <laughs> but uh, he basically was when Ken, Oregon Kid, was making those Cali Kush seeds. And uh, this guy, Paradise Seeds Mod, was basically distributing a lot of them for Ken, kind of middlemanning them. Mm-hmm. And that guy lived in Portland. And I kind of became friendly with him because he had access to all these genetics because he was basically like, he was an online seed and clone hustler, basically. He didn't really grow weed himself, but he would go around and find 10 growers in a local area get them to grow stuff for him basically and then he'd like try to get clones or get you to make seeds and then he'd take the seeds back sell them and keep his hustle going basically (laughs) and ken was like basically doing business with this guy too and they had one of his grower friends was this guy in uh burian that guy diamond Mm -hmm. who had the u-dub and uh so they started bringing up clones and stuff that ken was that ken had organ kid and that was like how i got og and uh the green and the um, purple bubba's Mm -hmm. (laughs) and all that stuff was from diamond and his partner that lived on the same block as him down in burian and i'd go visit those guys and they were from like redding or diamond was from like redding and he was like he had done a lot of hard drugs right like speed yeah and he had like done so much that he, if he ever touched it again, he'd like die from like phenol poisoning or something like that. So he was like a straight up medical patient, because um, he was like he was pretty, you know, he he had some uh, medical issues for sure, you know. Mm-hmm. But really, like pretty solid guy. Like he wasn't like he just uh, used drugs, right? But he like worked his whole life and everything, and ended up getting disability for like an on the job work accident or something like that that he got messed up from so he had a bunch of medical issues and um and that was kind of how oh, his name was john paradise seeds mod and that was kind of what john would do is he'd go around to all the um like medical patients and stuff and just kind of like use their growing facilities to either make hold sell broker seeds and clones on the internet and um and he was like the moderator for paradise seeds um uh, forum on Cannabis World. So he seemed super legitimate, right? Yeah. Like, Paradise Seeds trusts him to be their moderator. He must know people. And I guess he kind of did, but John was kind of just a dirtbag, and, I, you know, eventually I'll get a, I'll get Ken on this um, thing, too, because Ken's got all kinds <laughs> of great stories about all these people, because Ken was pretty deep in the, the online stuff, too, early on. Yeah. And, uh, and he's pretty instrumental in how OG Kush and Bubba Kush became um, as well known as they are. He's the one that put them online. He's the one that um, got that got it to Ghost. He's the one that gave Katsu to Bubba. I mean, it's like the distribution of these clones, especially related to online. And then when you factor in the fact that he was the first person to make S ones mm-hmm. of both OG and Bubba, and release them to the public. Yeah. He's responsible for the dissemination of that those two plants as much as anybody. For sure. And um and yeah, you know, he's got he's got all kinds of good stories. But uh, you know, one thing I, I remember you were saying at the uh farmers markets here in town. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember first going to them and I had a booth a couple times. I remember seeing you in line at the one at the union. Right yep. before I had met you, I just remembered seeing a group of dudes like smoking weed outside or whatever. Mm-hmm. There wasn't that many people usually in line. It'd be like a couple hundred, you know. And uh, I remember going around and I'd see jars called OG Kush and it was always Bubba yeah. inside. And I was like, what is wrong with this place? No, the first <laughs> the, the first time I got a clone of what I was told was OG Kush. Um, and like, you know, they had shown me the flowers, but I guess they were like... They probably like it was like Bubba cut early, right? Cut early, yeah, yeah. 
For so sure. So it's got like way cushier. Uh, you know, it's got a like a OG esque flavor to it, and the buds aren't super pur- uh, purple. They're not purple. So I was like, okay, this might be it, right? Then I grow it out. It turns purple. I'm like looking at it. I'm like, man, this this don't really look like OG. Yeah. Right. This is Bubba. Or like, master, you know, or I'm just, and I'm like trying to convince myself that it is, and I'm like asking people, like, "Yo, what do you think this is?" Well, I'll grow it again. I'll right. Grow it again. Maybe it just came out different. But then, just time. like comparing it to like what I my frame of reference of like you know Kush, like just like the uh, the more earthy, chocolatey, creamy, piney version of it. Totally. Um, yeah. Then come to find out it was Bubba, but I got that from this dispensary out here. And I think the guys were from Sacramento or something. There's like Seattle Art- Alternative Medical. Yep, I remember that. They were known for that, what they called OG Kush, which was Bubba and Lavender. Yeah. Yeah, the Lavender. That shit was pretty good. Like, as far as like one of the, you know, well known cuts of purple, I remember that one being pretty dank. Hell yeah. What do you think? We got some, uh, yeah. We'll take a break. Yeah, we'll take a break. Yeah.